In this video, you will see two experiments looking at different environmental factors that affect enzyme activity. The enzyme we're going to be using is called catalase, and this enzyme helps to break down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas, preventing the concentration of hydrogen peroxide from accumulating to dangerous levels in our cells. In this lab, we'll be using acids, bases, hot water, and extract from raw cow liver, so goggles are definitely a must, and a thorough cleanup afterwards will be required. These four flasks are filled with four different temperatures of water. The test tubes inside each flask have 10 milliliters of water of the same temperature as the flask itself. We'll measure the exact temperature later on. The extra water in the flask is to help the small volume of water in the test tube to remain at a constant temperature throughout our experiment. With this experiment, we can measure the effect of temperature on enzyme activity by measuring how long it takes for the enzymes to break down all, or at least most, of the hydrogen peroxide we're going to pour into each test tube later on. These four flasks are all filled with warm water, and the test tubes inside are each filled with liquids of different pH. This first one contains 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, which is extremely basic with a pH of around 13. This last one contains 10 milliliters of hydrochloric acid, which is obviously acidic, with a pH of around 1. These two in the middle both contain 10 milliliters of room temperature tap water, which is close to neutral with a pH of around 7. One of these will be our control group. We won't put any enzyme into this one, only water and our substrate, hydrogen peroxide. This control group should confirm for us that no reaction will occur without an enzyme present. And if there is a reaction, that means we've got a problem with our experimental design. With this experiment, we can measure the effect of pH on enzyme activity, once again by measuring how long it takes for the enzymes to break down all, or at least most, of the hydrogen peroxide we're going to pour into each test tube. The procedure for both experiments is pretty simple. Place one dropper full of enzyme extract into each test tube. Let these sit for about five minutes. Then add 10 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to each test tube and time how long the resulting reaction takes, if a reaction occurs at all. If you are doing this lab in class, you can stop the video now. If you are doing this lab virtually, keep watching in order to see the results of both experiments. Let's begin with the pH experiment, since this one also contains our control group. I'll start by squeezing one dropper full of my enzyme extract into each test tube, except for this one that's my control group. We'll need to let the enzyme sit there for a bit so that it can be thoroughly exposed to the conditions in each test tube. While you're waiting, you can enter the pH of each of these environments into your first data table. That would be 13 for the sodium hydroxide, or NaOH, 7 for both of these two with water in them, and 1 for the test tube with hydrochloric acid, or HCl. After about 5 minutes, we'll add 10 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to each test tube. With help, or crazy skills like mine, you can pour all four doses of hydrogen peroxide into all four test tubes simultaneously. At the same time, we'll start a timer, then record the time that has passed when each reaction appears to have stopped, or at least pretty much stopped. You can do these experiments one at a time too if you don't have help, but doing them all at once can be an interesting way to compare the results in real time. Okay, here we go. Remember to check the time when you see that the bubbles have pretty much stopped, and record this time in your data table. To be efficient with our time together, I will speed up the video and timer to double speed. If you don't see any evidence of a reaction in a test tube, just write no reaction in your data table.
Now let's do the temperature experiment. First, I'll put one dropper full of enzyme into each test tube. Then, while they sit for a bit to be exposed to the environment in each test tube, I will take a temperature reading. You should record these temperatures in your second data table. Just like in our last experiment, I will pour 10 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide into each test tube. Once again, I will do all four test tubes at the same time and start a timer. When you notice that the bubbles in the tube have stopped, or at least mostly stopped, record the time in your data table. Just try to be consistent about when you decide that each reaction is finished. Like last time, I've sped up the video and timer to double speed, just for your reference.
Now we're going to do some math to turn these times we recorded into rates, specifically the rate at which hydrogen peroxide was broken down in microliters per second. First, convert all your times into seconds. Remember, one minute is 60 seconds. So take the number of minutes you recorded, multiply by 60, then add any extra seconds you have left over. For example, 5 minutes and 23 seconds would be 5 times 60 plus 23 extra seconds for a total of 323 seconds. The hydrogen peroxide we were using was only 3% concentration. That means in 10 milliliters of what we poured in, there is actually only 0.3 milliliters of pure hydrogen peroxide. That's a very small number of milliliters, but it is a fairly sizable number of microliters. There are 1,000 microliters in a milliliter. So 0.3 milliliters multiplied by 1,000 works out to 300 microliters of hydrogen peroxide. To calculate our final rate, we will divide 300 microliters of hydrogen peroxide by the number of seconds each reaction lasted. And then we will have a rate in microliters of hydrogen peroxide per second. For example, if we use that same time value I just used in my previous example, 5 minutes 23 seconds or 323 seconds, 300 microliters of hydrogen peroxide divided by 323 seconds gives us a rate of 0.93 microliters of hydrogen peroxide per second. You should perform this calculation for each of the eight experiments you watch today and record these final numbers in your third and fourth data tables. For experiments where there was no reaction, the reaction rate would be zero. After completing your data tables, you've got everything you need to create some graphs and write up your conclusions.